Community Board 5. I'm Vicki Barbero, the chair. CB5's bylaws provide for special or emergency meetings other than the regular monthly meeting when required or necessary. As mm -hmm. you know, in most instances, when time is of the essence, the executive board will act with the full board ratifying the action at the next scheduled full board meeting. So tonight, the resolution that is before you is no doubt one of the most important proposals to come to our district in countless years. The replanning, renovation and reconstruction of Penn Station and the neighborhood around it. This is not just a large scale development project or a large rail project. We are hoping that this project will help repair the city's prior mistakes involving the disastrous demolition of the original Penn Station. Because of its scale and importance, it is critical that you are all aware of what has transpired and the concerns and ramifications for our district since the implementation of Empire State Development's Community Advisory Committee, which began its confidential meetings early this year. So Layla, EJ, Clayton, and I were involved as members and representatives of CB5, whose district comprises 90 to 95% of this proposal. They will lead us into the discussion beginning with our initial involvement and where and why we are now at this point in the process. As far as our procedure tonight, we'll start our meeting by hearing from any elected officials that are in attendance, followed by any elected representatives and members of the public who would like to address the board on this very important and momentous project in our district. All reps and members of the public will be given two minutes to speak and anyone wishing to speak, please sign up now and do so by 620. We'll then enter the business session of the board as we usually do to discuss the resolution that is before us taking questions and comments that lead us to taking a vote. Comments or questions from anyone other than the members of the board are allowed only with the chair's approval. So I'll start this evening's meeting uh, let me take a look and see if there's anyone here from the electeds. Um, I don't I, see anybody, Vicki. No. Uh, no reps, right? That's right. I don't see anybody as oh. of right now. So then we can go right to the public. Uh, and we do have three raised hands already. So let's start with George Calderaro. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. I'm George Calderaro, a representative of the 29th Street Neighborhood Association, the Victorian Society, and the Historic Districts Council, among other organizations on whose boards I serve and comprise the Empire Station Coalition, a broad-based collection of community groups, which coalesced earlier this year in response and opposition to corrupt Governor Cuomo's proposed Empire Station District, which will essentially bulldoze our neighborhood surrounding Penn Station. I and the groups I work with are opposed to the scheme to level blocks of Midtown around Penn Station containing up to 50 viable historic buildings, notably including the Hotel Pennsylvania by McKim Mead and White, who designed the original Penn Station, and containing hundreds of businesses with 9,000 jobs, at least 200 residents, and up to 50 historic viable buildings, as noted. It should also be noted that Vornado has given at least $400,000 to corrupt disgraced Governor Cuomo to build who built uh, his signature pet project Moynihan Station which is of questionable value. It's time to learn from our mistakes and end Moses era tactics of declaring a functioning community blighted 
and using eminent domain to bypass the public process to destroy historic buildings and vibrant communities. As Senator Liz Kruger reasonably asks, when did Andrew Cuomo become Robert Moses? In addition to 20 million square feet of unneeded commercial office space, the proposal also includes two hotels, but does not consider the relatively easy, sustainable, and economical renovation of the two great vast hotels it plans to demolish, the Hotel Stewart and the Hotel Pennsylvania, one of the largest hotels in the world when it opened in 1919. The Hotel Pennsylvania is a monumental structure, as you all know, designed as noted by McKinney Mead and White as an integral uh, part of the Pennsylvania Station Complex. Um, I, and, uh, I, I'll just quickly note that uh, the, the 2021 Pritzker Prize, the, uh, the architect's, architecture's highest award, was given to two architects who adaptively reuse buildings. They have never demolished a building in their successful practices. This is just, I, I think my time is up, so I will just close quickly uh, by noting that our, our, our community already resembles post-war London with vast lots left vacant for years where significant buildings with the New York Landmarks Preservation Commission refused to protect were leveled for the sake of glassy, glossy development that never got built. I, I don't have to point out 32nd and 5th, the, the former Bancroft building, the Casco building. Right now, the, the magnificent Demarest building is being two blocks from Penn Station is being demolished. Uh, to quote uh, Ada Lu Louise Huxtable, these are monumental acts of vandalism. Again, New York City must learn from its mistakes and stop destroying historic viable buildings, housing businesses and residents to construct unwanted, unneeded towers that only develop benefit developers, in this case, Vornado. Please try and wrap up, George. I'll wrap up and thank you for opposing this catastrophic proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you again. Uh, next up will be Lynn Ellsworth. Hi, Lynn. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I'm Lynn Ellsworth. I'm chair of the Alliance for a Human Scale City. I'm also coordinator of the Empire Station Coalition. This is our coalition's statement to CB5. Uh, the Empire Station Coalition is composed of 13 community and civic organizations. The coalition opposes the Empire Station plan for the Penn area, including the minor variations to that plan recently proposed by Governor Hochul. The plan is unnecessarily destructive of our city's historic fabric and eliminates a functioning viable swath, swath of the city. It unnecessarily demolishes people's homes, destroys thousands of small business jobs, and foolishly builds 10 new Class A office towers, an extension really of the widely hated Hudson Yards that does not serve the needs of small business. Such a bloated development plan is one that only benefits Vernado, the city's largest real estate investment trust. This push for a developer's fiefdom, the so-called Vernado campus, destroys a church, a beloved sky bridge, multiple landmark hotels, and a rare remnant of the original Penn Station. It is a plan filled with spite, displacement, and destruction. Moreover, the proposed improvements to Penn Station are minor and do not need to be funded by Vernado skyscrapers. They are lipstick on the pig improvements and could easily be funded through other means. Ten new towers cannot be justified by any reasonable argument. Tossing in a bit of affordable housing does not improve the plan, nor does pedestrianization of the streets soon to be in dark shadows. The tragedy is this. Better ideas exist and are being ignored. Madison Square Garden could easily be moved by repurposing the billions in funding slated for unnecessary borough jails. And converting Penn Station to allow through running, a solid proposal, would avoid most of the wanton destruction. destruction. Last, an above ground station can easily be achieved and would better serve the broad public interest. We urge CB5 and cities to condemn this project and the attempts to make it palatable through superficial tweaks that fooled no one. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, next up will be Brad Vogel. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. My name is Brad Vogel and I'm here today uh, as both a member of the Empire Station Coalition 
and also a member of the Preservation Committee of the City Club of New York. And I am strongly opposed to the proposed barbaric act that the governor, uh, Governor Hochul and Governor Cuomo have foisted upon the city. This is not a transit complex. It is a real estate grab masquerading as one. As uh, both George and Lynn have laid out, this is a very anti-urban plan if you actually get down to it. It uses eminent domain. It is heavy on the displacement, including, and let us not forget, hundreds of residents, not just businesses and not just historic buildings. There are many of those at stake, but there are people who would be needlessly displaced the scale and scope of this project reveals that it is really not about improving or restoring Penn Station to some type of grandeur. It is really about the real estate development rights involved here. And it really is an end run around Euler uh, using, using a state authority to make this happen should really raise everyone's hackles all the more because this is a problem. This will set a precedent for yet another way that communities and neighborhoods have their wishes overridden uh, by those with far greater power. So I hope you will join me in opposing a plan that would needlessly destroy multiple landmark eligible buildings and would displace people and would really not solve transit problems and is simply an exercise in power. Thank you for voting no. Thank you, Brad. Uh, next up would be Eugene Senegaliano. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Eugene Senegaliano, and I'm actually an at-risk, rent-stabilized senior who lives at 251 West 30th Street. I'm here representing the hundreds of residents, 400 businesses, and 10,000 jobs that will lose their homes, offices, and work with almost two full city blocks destroyed by the revised fatally flawed Penn Station proposal and their preferred Southern expansion alternative. The revised proposal has minor improvements to the original GPP, but massive displacement, loss of significant and historic buildings and destruction of a community are still there. These residents and businesses rely on the lower affordable rents in our vibrant, working class and at scale neighborhood. But Empire State Development is using their completely outdated, inaccurate and therefore deceptive neighborhood condition study to portray our at risk buildings and many others to be in disrepair and poor condition to help justify why they should be torn down. This is totally false and our buildings and others have undergone multi-million dollar renovations over the past years. The six residential senior families in just my building have lived here for over 40 years. Like many New Yorkers who've seen the dark times and later the rebirth of our city, we stayed, worked and volunteered our time along with our neighbors to give back to the city we love and help build a stronger, better and more inclusive New York. Yet the revised Pace Penn Station proposal does not even protect at risk of displacement residents or Well, actually runs of their legal rent stabilization by using a federal entity to do the condemnation. New York deserves a much better Penn Improvement Plan that respects and protects our homes, businesses, community, and historic buildings, and is responsible to the taxpayers who will have to pay for it. A better plan should include creating a unified regional rail network and transforming Penn Station into a modern, thorough, above-ground running station a better plan would be economically responsible and not count on risky financing schemes and pilots with no guarantees that they would ever have any certainty of paying for this terrible plan. A better plan would not just give us a stub in New Jersey transit station if the Southern expansion is approved and with no possible through running till 2080 and destroy almost two city blocks. I urge you all to vote no on this. Thank you, Eugene. Okay, next up is Roberta Gelb. Hi, I am a resident of West 16th Street. Unfortunately, I'm just about 
one half block away from being in CB5, where politically is exactly where I belong. This is a horrible plan. Look at it. I mean, it, what's happening in this city is atrocious. We have the highest commercial vacancy rate, and they want to build these buildings. I mean, it's a land grab, and it's a kiss to the developers, and that's it. And I'll say, you want to kiss? You can kiss my you-know-what if you want this plan to go through. I can't believe that this has been approved, and it has been kept quiet, because most of the people I know who live in the area had, did not even know about it. And I like to think that I'm involved in the community. I didn't know anything about this. I thought they were fixing Penn Station. A hundred families are going to lose their homes. One hundred families. These people, 26 of them, have rent stabilization protections. There is nothing in there. They talk about affordable housing. You know what they're talking about with affordable housing? They're talking about housing that is two, three, four thousand dollars a month. That's not what these tenants need. They need tenant protections, and there is no protection, nothing in this for the tenants to say nothing about the commercial businesses, small businesses that need protections. They're going to just wipe them out. And what about vacancy of small businesses in the neighborhood? If you take a look around, walk around, we have enough vacancies to house a lot more businesses and they want to build. If anybody sees this as anything except a land grab and a kiss to these developers and you can kiss New York City goodbye because this is the beginning of the end. And that's all I have to say, but thank you for your time and thank you Community Board 5 for being rational and not in the pocket of these developers. Thank you, Roberta. Okay, next up is Felicia Park Rogers. Hi, I'm Felicia Park Rogers. I'm the Director of Regional uh, Infrastructure Projects for Tri-State Transportation Campaign, which is a organization looking at the needs of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut in terms of transit and transportation. We're not a land use organization. Um, but we have been very interested and focused on this project because of its uh, potential to transform Penn Station as a transit hub and as the most used train station in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Pre-COVID, 650,000 riders a day would come through Penn Station, and the estimates for 2038 were to double that amount coming from New Jersey. There are clear transit needs to improve this station and to bring it into the 21st century. The tracks were built in 1910 and they are not able to accommodate uh, modern technology or current usage. Um, however, we find this plan to be lacking in terms of clarity of information of what the funding and financing will go from the properties, the real estate properties towards the transit improvements and uh, we are skeptical that building stub and terminal through Penn expansion will create the necessary capacity improvements um, or the ability to reach towards a regional rail system for our region um, as needed. We would like to see surface agreements with DOT to have a 34th Street busway to close traffic on um, 32nd Street two cars and have it be pedestrian only. We are pleased with some of the pedestrian and safety improvements, but we're very concerned that there, this plan still has no train haul. And after the travesty of what happened with the original Penn Station, we're surprised that the region would consider building more developments and train hall in this region. Uh, we would like to see ESD work more closely with the city, with the DOT, and with the neighborhood community to find solutions that work for everyone. Thank you, Felicia. Uh, is there anyone else from the public who would like to speak? I don't see any hands. So, see, whoops, we have two more. If anyone wants to speak, please sign up now. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Mackey.
Lisa, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Um, my name is Lisa Mackey. Eugene Siliganiano has commented eloquently and thoroughly researched this overwhelming and upsetting situation. He has asked us as tenants that are directly affected by this destructive plan to also speak out. It has been stated repeatedly, there is no need to tear down buildings to create the through running trains plans at Penn Station. I am specifically talking about the block where a group of senior tenants have lived for 30 plus years. I am one of those tenants at 251 West 30th Street, New York City. There, then there is no need to enact eminent domain to tear down these buildings. Therefore, the north side of the block, 30th Street between 7th and 8th Avenue should remain standing and we should be able to remain in our lifelong rent stabilized homes. If the owners of these buildings would sell the buildings for the purpose to be torn down, then we as rent stabilized tenants would have to be relocated to cons commensurate housing according to the New York uh, City rent stabilized guidelines. Will these guidelines be followed by any actions taken by the Empire State Board? And the light on the south side of West 30th Street will be greatly affected. Many tenants, both residential and commercial, should be aware how awful that would be. They would be overshadowed by an ominous and dark environment with lots of traffic on the streets. Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up will be Beth Pollock. Hi, thanks so much for giving me this time. Uh, my name is Seth Pollock. I am the director of New York Community Mobilization for Housing Works. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Housing Works, but for anyone who isn't, we are a healing community of people living with and affected by HIV and AIDS. And our mission is to end the dual crises of homelessness and AIDS. We've provided services to over 30,000 homeless and low-income New Yorkers, um, from mental and behavioral health to primary care, job training, reentry programs, youth programs, the list goes on. Um, we're particularly invested in the future of this project as our positive health project is housed quite nearby at 301 West 37th Street. Um, the Empire Station GPP outlines a focus on office, retail, and hotel space, but at Housing Works, we know that housing is healthcare. This isn't a goal or a mission statement or a marketing slogan, but our work has shown the link between stable housing and achieving viral suppression among other critical health outcomes. This redevelopment plan um, focuses instead on office, retail, and hotel space, sectors that are in crises at the exclusion of housing. And we can't support a plan without a significant investment in low and moderate income housing, including housing for very low income households. I also know that the GPP includes a number of references to public realm amenities. I'm sure many of us are familiar with Moynihan Hall's hostile architecture that makes it somewhere between forbidding, uncomfortable, and impenetrable up to many people with mobility issues uh, or anyone waiting for a train who wants to sit down. So uh, I would hope that these two concerns are taken into account um, if any of us here are interested in seeing any development happen at the site. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Next up will be T. Lawrence Wheatman. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I don't have prepared statement. I uh, am also a, a tenant at uh, 251 West 30th Street. And um, uh, indeed, um, there's uh, just one thing that I want uh, to make every, anybody aware here or everybody aware here is that um, we have been here for, I'm, I, oh, I should say this too. I, I'm born and raised in Manhattan. I've never lived any place else. And more than two thirds of my 70 years on this planet have been here in this neighborhood, uh, 41 years here and three years down the block and et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, th that time and before I've always been, and many of the uh, other tenants in this building also have been volunteers for the city. 
Um, I spent 35 years uh, uh, with a, 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 what was then a brand new concept that's now spread all over the world, something called City as School, where we uh, um, took care of uh, high school students who were uh, failing or, or just needed some leadership, uh, primarily not having anything to do with anything they did, but rather family situations and things like homelessness. Um, and that the uh, fact is that um, you know, being this close to the High Line, which for 50 years was fallow land here, the least valuable land in uh, Manhattan, as I am uh, understanding, uh, to the point where the owners of that land abandoned the land. Um, and for uh, some good portion of those 50 years where the city attempted to get enough money together to tear that down so that it would make it more valuable, uh, it was the effect of uh, local residents who uh, dressed up two blocks of the High Line and made it gorgeous and all of a sudden that became valuable land. Um, and it, they're stretching that out to make the high line is what made that land now, as I understand, the most valuable land in the world. Uh, by, um, by taking away us, you're taking away the thing that made this land so useful and valuable to you. And that sort of made, is sort of like committing suicide on yourself if you are in the real estate community that thinks that this is a good idea. Uh, because even before the pandemic, uh, as I understand, Hudson Yards was not getting the occupancy they expected and whatever occupancy they were getting were, was coming from the rest of this neighborhood, thereby emptying out places that uh, would otherwise have been occupied. Um, it's a horrible plan. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to that. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, did you have something further that you wanted to say? I see your hand is still up. Oh, Lynn Bos. No, it's Lynn Ellsworth. Lynn? Yes, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add that I had forgotten to explain that our coalition is comp opposing this project is composed of the 29th Street Association, the Historic Districts Council, the City Club of New York, Human Scale NYC, Take Back NYC, Limited Equity at Penn South, the Midtown South Community Council, Save Chelsea, the Council of Chelsea Block Associations, the Victorian Society, Rethink NYC, the Congress for New Urbanism, the NYC chapter, and the Environmental Simulation Center. Thank you for allowing me to clarify that. Sure, thank you very much, Lynn. Okay, I do not see any other hands. I think that concludes, uh, oh, Eugene? Yes, I, if I get a chance, I do have one more thing just to add that's important. I need you all to understand and that as of right now, ESD has no language in it that protects rent-stabilized tenants. Um, it only says that people have a right to return to an affordable unit. Um, we really impress on CV5 that ESD should follow the recommendations that the community advisory working group recommended to them that has much better and stronger language that would allow much better protection for rent stabilized seniors and other residential and business tenants. And we really wish that both CB4 and CB5 members of the community advisory working group for Empire State Development Corporation all agreed to these when that recommendation document was sent to ESD, and we feel strongly that CB5 should also adopt that language in any response they have back to Empire State Development Corporation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eugene. All right, I see three more people that signed up after the allotted time. It's now after 6.30. We will allow them to speak, starting with William Otterson. Mr. Otterson, you can unmute yourself. And I, I just was able to, thank you. I too am a resident of 251 West 30th and have lived here and been through a massive uh, 
upturns while they renovated Madison Square Garden, while, while they took down the two 400 foot high smokestacks with nine jackhammers outside my window going 24 hours a day for several months. But I want to put together a letter to President Biden. And here's the, how I end it. Put your name on the real solution to Joe, to what is needed at Penn Station, through running trains, a move that will alleviate the rail transit bottlenecks we now have, and will make your name synonymous with the future of rail. They call you Amtrak Joe. It's time to live up to that name. You're a rail fan, a railroad man. Create Create a regional railroad network of through running trains with Penn Station as its central hub that can and will be the rebirth of rail in the Northeast of our great nation. It should be noted that his name, President Biden, is uh, on the Wilmington, Delaware Amtrak station, the Biden station. Thank you. Thank you, William. Next up is Myrna Rodriguez, I think. Hi. Do you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I am also a tenant for 40 years at 247 West 30th Street. And I raised my daughters here. Um, I do not want to be, I don't want to move. I don't agree with what's going on. I very, I'm very concerned about the rent stabilized as it being a permanent uh, privilege that we should have. Um, and I think that it should be done in writing before anything happens as far as us being displaced here. Um, I'm very concerned. My health is not so well, and it's very stressful to be in a situation like this, especially when, um, you know, I've been here for 40 years. I don't want to move. That's what I have to say. Okay. Thank you, Myrna. Mm -hmm. Next up, John Mudd. Go ahead, John, you can unmute yourself. Okay, are you, are you, are you, are you, hold on. I'm using my phone, hold on. Let me turn, let me turn this off. I'm gonna get out of the Zoom because I haven't been able to connect on, on the Zoom, so I'm on the phone. And anyway, um, I'm John Mudd, I'm with the Midtown South Community Council and thank you, Vicki, for having us. Um, uh, I've been here around for 38 years, been the council president for about 35 or so, and I'm with the coalition, by the way. I mean, um, so I'll start with, um, th this is a, a real deep problem. I mean, we're a traumatized nation held, and we're held hostage by this economic system of ours, and it, it fails to deliver some basic human principles. I mean, we're closing down hospitals and getting rid of ICU beds. We've lost 20,000 hospital beds over the last two decades. And then we have a pandemic and we could have used those hospital beds. And speaking of COVID, I mean, they're not, the vaccines aren't rich, uh, reaching the poorer nations. Call it apartheid, racism, vulture capitalism, but don't ignore the cold blooded murder by its management here or, or there because, corporate, because of corporate interests. And, I mean, we've killed a lot of people and, that should not, and we shouldn't be polite about this. I mean, this is a real existential uh, crisis. This isn't just about the developers uh, getting their way here. It's, it's more than that, okay? And if you think I'm off topic, this is the topic, corporate interest. I mean, starting with the hotel boom in 2008 that allow hotels developers to saturate the Midtown area, they squashed a lot of affordable housing, uh, tenement buildings, uh, and, 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 and they, they reduced the incentives to do housing. 
the Empire State, uh, Station complex dwarfs the recently finished Hudson Yards. Uh, and it brings more commercial property to, uh, to an already oversaturated commercial Mecca. I mean, it's, it also rebuilds part of the transportation system, yeah, but without foresight or any kind of a vision. I mean, they're, they're gonna re tear down and rebuild for profits if, if say this doesn't work out, this visionary plan. Okay, somehow, let me just say, I close real quickly here, okay. We know the Hudson Yard development didn't go well. I mean, we're, we're on the hook, the, the, the taxpayers are on the hook for $2.2 .2 billion. I mean, uh, and, and to finish this off, um, this, uh, this misstep is gonna increase the housing and the, and the homeless crisis and, 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 and the health crisis on top of it. And I'll end with that. I hear the little beep. Thank you, John. Okay, we are ending with, I'll allow this, uh, Lawrence, um, do you wish to come back on? I will allow it. And you'll be the last one to speak. Thank you so much. I just have one question in case anybody has the answer to this because it's been bothering me for some time now is that of course, Pennsylvania Station is called Pennsylvania Station, not Pennsylvania Terminal, which is what it has been since uh, the mid sixties. And before that was a station where there was through running trains. This is what I recall. I, I was a little boy then, but I, I, it seems like you could take a, a train from New Jersey to Long Island or vice versa back then and uh, uh, north as well. Um, uh, does anybody know the answer to my question, which is uh, why, uh, why is it going to, why had it, it seems so difficult to return it to its, uh, to its original, to its namesake? <laughs> Lawrence, what I would suggest is uh, you give us your contact information and we'll see if we can get an answer for you and, um, and take it from there, okay? Uh, I bet there's somebody here that perhaps knows the answer or no? In public session, we really don't get into ah, conversations. Very we, good. We're asking for input from the public on the subject that's at hand, but you do have a very good question and we'll be happy to research it for you, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, that concludes our public session, uh, which means we're now entering the business session of the board where, as I mentioned, uh, board members, uh, um, only board members are allowed to speak. So um, I want to, uh, I think everyone is on video, but I just want to remind everyone to have your video on as much as possible during the meeting. And at this point, I would call upon Layla to start the introduction and the discussion. Layla. Thank you so much, Vicki. Um, so I prepared a little deck and uh, Craig uh, has it and he's been able to share his screen so that I can uh, walk you through with uh, some little visuals. Um, but while uh, Craig uh, puts that up, um, I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, first and foremost that um, we uh, we worked uh, closely with um, uh, E.J. Kalifarski, the chair of our uh, Transportation and Environment Committee, as well as uh, Clayton Smith, uh, the chair of the Parks and Public Spaces Committee, and uh, our fierce leader, Vicky Barbero, the chair of our board. Um, and we engage directly with uh, ESD in this um, CAC working group. Uh, so I just want to, uh, you know, make it clear that um, this uh, the, the, this work that I'm presenting is really a, a collective effort. Um, we spent a, a lot of time, and uh, we're very happy to finally be able to uh, brief the rest of um, of the board on uh, this very very important proposal. Um, and I want to thank uh, EJ, Clayton, and Vicky for um, all their all their work. So uh, we are here uh, tonight to uh, give a uh, overview to uh, our uh, full membership, uh, the, the full membership of our board on this uh, proposal. You've heard about it already twice. Uh, we had, uh, we did comment on the, uh, the scoping uh, 
of this proposal. Um, and, uh, and then again, we did uh, comment on um, the, uh, the actual uh, proposal itself um, in uh, February. Uh, we are here tonight uh, yet again, um, and I'm going to uh, walk you through uh, the, the, the chronology so we can go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, so, uh, first of all, you know, the, the, what, what is in front of us is uh, a GPP. It's a general project plan, and a GPP is a state action uh, that is driven by uh, ESD, which is the uh, Empire Station uh, Empire State Development Corporation, which is the uh, economic uh, development arm of uh, the the state of um, of New York. And um, basically, what they are uh, proposing is an action that would override uh, the zoning of the city of uh, of New York. Uh, the project area is uh, underlined, as you can see on uh, this image. Uh, next slide. So the purpose of uh, this uh, GPP, this uh, land use action that would uh, override the, uh, the zoning uh, regulations of the city of New York, uh, the stated goals are to create, to create a cohesive transit-oriented district generate as essential revenue for the reconstruction of Penn Station and for improvements to subway stations and other transit facilities, accommodate the expansion of Penn Station to the south, significantly increase the station's capacity, encourage high density development around a world-class transportation hub, and reflect a public commitment to the area commensurate with the essential infrastructure investments already funded. So those are the goals uh, stated by ESD that this GPP uh, is uh, proposing to achieve. Next slide. Uh, so in terms of the timeline, uh, the governor uh, at the time, Governor Cuomo, um, announced the project at uh, a state of the state uh, um, uh, meeting in uh, January 8, 2020. And then uh, this project was really fast-tracked at, at high speed. Um, on uh, July 1st, there was a notice of public scoping and a draft scope of work. Um, on July 7th, there was a public scoping meeting um, and that was followed uh, in uh, December of 2020 by a final scope of work that was released. Um, this, this timeline, you know, just for, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with those kinds of uh, land use actions, this timeline is actually uh, very accelerated. On um, February 18, uh, the draft GPP, um, as well as the draft environmental impact statement was, um, was released. So if you recall, at our March uh, meeting of uh, Community Board 5, we did comment on the draft GPP and the draft EIS. Uh, we took the position uh, to actually uh, object to the entire proposal, uh, finding uh, many flaws, uh, including you know, too much density. Um, at the time, we had a very poor clarity on the transit improvements that were uh, a stated goal, but were not included in uh, the proposal, um, as well as the, uh, a slew of other uh, problems that we saw, including displacement, lack of affordable housing. Um, the uh, community boards, uh, board five, uh, community board four, as well as the elected officials, uh, also uh, deplore the lack of proper community engagement and um, uh, deplore the fact that um, the community engagement was was really minimal and uh, and more lip service than uh, than real engagement. On July on April twenty seven, uh, ESD agreed uh, to actually convene a broader uh, community engagement group known as the Community Advisory Council Working Group uh, with the uh, beloved acronym CACWAG. 
So the CACWAG uh, was uh, extended and uh, started a series of 11 meetings, weekly meetings, um, at which uh, members of the community, um, elected officials, um, and other stakeholders were able to learn much more about uh, the, the proposal. Uh, we, so we, EJ, uh, Clayton, uh, Vicky and myself, we know a lot about this project and the reason you don't is because these meetings were confidential and we were not at liberty to share any of the materials uh, or discuss any of the findings that uh, we, we had made during uh, these meetings. Um, so the material for these meetings is uh, still confidential. The material was actually uh, foiled by a watchdog organization and uh, the material is published on the website of this watchdog organization. Uh, at least some of the material, um, we are still not at liberty to share this material uh, with, uh, with the public or with the, the members of the board. Uh, but it is our understanding that uh, this watchdog organization is planning to uh, foil the entirety of this material and we are urging ESD to actually make this information public. Uh, so back to the timeline, on August 3rd, 2021, the CACWA delivered comments to ESD. Uh, on uh, August 21st, um, uh, August 24th, 2021, uh, Governor Hochul became governor. Um, on, uh, and that basically put a pause on the review by ESD of the uh, recommendation that had been issued by the CACWA. On November uh, 4 and November 9, ESD presented uh, the proposed revision to the draft GPP to the CACWAG. And uh, we here we are. Um, what you should know is that on December 8, next week, Wednesday, uh, ESD will hold a public hearing on the draft GPP, the proposed revisions, and the draft environmental impact statement. Uh, this is the reason why we're uh, convening this uh, extraordinary meeting tonight so that we can adopt uh, an official position of CB5. And although we could have uh, taken this step through a, uh, uh, the executive uh, committee, we felt that this project was way too important not to give a proper briefing uh, to the full board and uh, engage with uh, all of you on uh, a project of this magnitude. Um, continuing to look into the future, um, uh, Q1 or Q2 of 2022, ESD will produce a final GPP and uh, environmental impact statement, and the board of directors um, of the uh, of ESD will um, approve will be asked to approve. Uh, this, this proposal. Uh, it is worth noting that uh, the directors of ESD are all appointed by the governor and uh, it is likely that uh, they will uh, simply you know, rubber stamp uh, this, uh, this final GPP. Um, once this GPP is approved, then a public realm task force will be launched. Uh, it will not be launched uh, before that. Uh, next slide. So, um, as I uh, explained, the uh, the CACWAG uh, was broadly expanded uh, when it was uh, convened uh, at the end of April, and uh, it included uh, all the elected officials who represent uh, this particular area of, uh, of Manhattan. Uh, they uh, included residents as well as um, uh, representatives of union, uh, labor groups, um, as well as uh, civic organizations such as uh, MAS uh, and RPA. They also uh, included special interest groups such as REBNE. Um, and uh, they uh, also included uh, partners and uh, advisors, uh, including Amtrak, MTA, New Jersey Transit, and uh, Vornado. Uh, observing representatives included members of City Hall, the Department of City Planning, and the Department of uh, the New York City uh, DOT. 
Uh, next slide. Uh, the CACWAC meeting dates and themes is on this slide. So the, uh, the first meeting was on April 27. Um, we met uh, once a week. Uh, the themes included an introductory uh, meeting, a presentation on the uh, regional transit context, uh, a presentation on gateway, um, the Penn Station improvements and expansion, uh, the uh, a meeting on the financing and funding mechanism uh, that was delivered by Ernst and Young, uh, who is a consultant uh, both for ESD and for Vornado uh, jointly. Um, a uh, review of the GPP uh, by uh, FX Collaborative, uh, who is actually an architect an urban uh, design firm uh, that has been commissioned both by ESD, um, uh, MTA, and Vornado. Uh, we had a meeting on public realm and, and public transit improvements, urban design, uh, growth framework. Um, we had a recap session. Uh, then the, uh, the uh, summary of the, uh, the CACWA comments was uh, delivered. And uh, as I said, on November 4 and November 9, uh, ESD presented the revisions to the draft GPP. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here is uh, what this uh, proposal looks like. Um, as I said, uh, it is a land use action. It is entirely separate and uh, segregated from uh, any transportation uh, proposals. So it is uh, not connected in really in any way uh, and can be entirely decoupled from the Penn Station reconstruction, which is a project that is currently underway and uh, being driven by MTA. And it is, and this GPP project is also entirely separate from the Penn Station expansion, this uh, proposal to expand Penn Station with new tracks to the south of the existing Penn. And the Penn Station expansion is being driven by Amtrak. Okay, so those two projects are proceeding. They are under review. They are doing the rounds of what those proposals do, uh, putting together um, environmental uh, materials and all, all of that good stuff. What is in front of us is strictly what you see here. Um, it is uh, 10 towers. So um, as you can see, this proposal is uh, proposing uh, 10 towers that would be located on um, eight uh, different sites. Um, a number of uh, those uh, sites that are uh, entire city blocks would have uh, two towers. Uh, what you see is, um, it, uh, I, and ho ho hopefully, um, I don't have to give too much of a crash course on what FAR is. Uh, it stands for floor area ratio, and it is the metrics to, uh, to illustrate density. So just for a comparison, uh, typically in our district, CB5, which is you know, the midtown district, uh, we're a very dense district already. Most of the buildings in our district are uh, a 10 FAR, and um, in Midtown, uh, the, uh, the, the base FAR is 15. And uh, the, the new buildings that uh, we have seen, uh, for example, in the um, East Midtown uh, area, um, reach a, an FAR of uh, 23 to 26. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the density that was initially uh, proposed uh, in February would reach uh, a, a uh, FAR of 40 for uh, the densest building. This is a density that has never been built in New York City, ever, ever, ever. Uh, the, the top density uh, that ever exists in the city is uh, a uh, 30 FAR and it's in Hudson Yards and it concerns just one building. So this particular proposal was uh, calling for uh, buildings going all the way to 40 FAR others going to uh, 30 and, um, and a, uh, an overall uh, average density of uh, 28. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, so there was a great opposition to the density, including from our, our board, and uh, ESD uh, made some revisions. Uh, so this is what is currently being proposed. Um, they have developed uh, two, two alternatives, a commercial alternative and a uh, residential alternative. So let's start with the, uh, the, the commercial. Um, the uh, the, the uh, uh, pink uh, light red uh, building that has a 13 FAR um, is located in CB4 and uh, this building would be residential and would have a uh, affordable housing component it would generate 118 units of affordable housing. Um, it is unclear uh, what level of affordability uh, would be available in this, in this particular building and uh, what kind of uh, rules and mechanism would actually um, rule this, the, the, this particular uh, use. Um, the, uh, the rest of the buildings uh, in, in this commercial alternative would all be commercial. Uh, they would reach uh, a 30 FAR. Um, and as you can see, especially to the uh, northeast of uh, the, uh, the, the proposed area, uh, the buildings would be uh, clustered very closely. And, uh, and you, you can already see it on, the, on these renderings, you know, would create uh, a very overwhelming massing um, and uh, a very unfriendly uh, sidewalk uh, condition, uh, dark and, and in, the, uh, in the shadows. Uh, next slide. So this is the residential alternative. The residential alternative would call for um, a portion of uh, the uh, the 21 FAR building that is located in C4. That's the uh, the building to the um, uh, lower uh, left portion of uh, of your screen uh, to have a uh, uh, residential component. Um, the, uh, the entire, the, the base of, uh, the building that is to the, uh, upper left portion of your screen that has an orange base and a, uh, red pink, uh, uh, top portion, uh, the orange base would be a hotel and the top portion would be residential and would include some affordable units. And then uh, to the east, uh, to the right of your screen, uh, the, the building massing would have a, a base that would be a commercial building and the top portion would be residential. This residential portion would have some affordability. So what is important to understand with this particular uh, alternative is that the, the residential alternative is optional. It is at the discretion of the developer, whatever they wanna do, they can choose to do. So if they choose to do commercial, they can do commercial, which is the previous slide. Uh, Craig, actually, can you tog toggle uh, back to the, the previous slide so that you can see? So they can do that, or if we can go back to the uh, residential, or they can do that. It's at their discretion. I think that because it's at their discretion, it kind of speaks for itself. It's uh, pretty obvious that um, the commercial alternative is, uh, has more density and therefore is more lucrative and uh, works best towards their bottom line. So uh, for a developer to elect to choose a residential alternative, given that there is no compelling reason to do so, and there's no incentive to do so, um, would be very unlikely. We're pleased that at least it exists, but we are um, uh, very dubious that it would uh, ever be uh, the, the, the preferred uh, alternative by uh, the developers. Uh, next slide. So uh, in terms of phasing, this is what uh, is uh, currently expected. Um, sites uh, um, four, five, six, and eight, which are to the um, north of, uh, of the area, uh, are anticipated to be, uh, to be completed uh, by 2028, um, this is a best case, a best case scenario. Um, and then the, uh, the sites to the south, um, which would only happen uh, as a result of uh, the Penn Station expansion project 
to be uh, determined to be the preferred option. Um, this phase two would happen by uh, 2038. What is important to note uh, with uh, this uh, phasing is that there is no compelling uh, mechanism to actually force the developers to build. And you're gonna think, well, that could be a good thing so that you know we keep the status quo, they do their GPP, but then nothing happens and, and that's it. The problem with that is that the goal, the stated goal of this GPP is to actually uh, generate uh, revenue from, from these buildings. So if these buildings don't get built, then there's no revenue coming in. The other concern is that if these buildings don't get built, there is a risk that uh, some of these sites uh, could be demolished and remain vacant, which is a big problem uh, in our district where, you know, especially when a property is uh, worthy of historic de uh, designation and, his, you know, landmark protection, um, it actually creates this uh, very, um, uh, you know, like, uh, size, you know, unfortunate side effects uh, that basically it's an incentive for a property owner to demolish the property so that then there's nothing to landmark and protect. Uh, while this developer may not have any intention to actually redevelop the property in the near future. So uh, the, uh, the Pennsylvania Hotel is uh, at high risk of uh, uh, basically, you know, going through this uh, th this fate because um, there is an effort, uh, including by Community Board Five. Uh, we are actually on record uh, ten or twelve years ago uh, advocating for uh, the Pennsylvania Hotel to be landmarked. Um, so, if this effort were to be uh, advanced, um, then the uh, the developer would have an incentive to actually demolish the building, and we could end up with. Uh, vacant uh, sites uh, that may remain vacant for, for a long time. So um, th this is uh, a, a, a complicated uh, issue with, uh, with quite a bit of, uh, of dilemma uh, as we're uh, dealing with this. Uh, next slide. All right, so this proposal would also be accompanied uh, while the, the, uh, the redevelopment of, uh, of these buildings uh, would happen with some below grade pedestrian concourses. Uh, the, um, on, the, on the right is uh, what was in the original uh, GPP that was uh, introduced in February, and then to the left, it is uh, a, a proposed uh, alternative. Um, they are pretty similar, and basically what, what this does is uh, create uh, entrances directly from uh, the, the, uh, the proposed new buildings um, into uh, Penn Station, or uh, creating a, um, a concourse uh, that would go all the way to, uh, to Herald Square. Uh, what is important to note uh, with uh, this, uh, this proposals um, is that a number of these uh, concourses already exist. So uh, we're not really gaining that much. Um, basically, you know, they would be uh, enhanced and, and improved, uh, in, in particular, the, uh, the Gimbal's passageway that exists and that basically links 7th Avenue to 6th Avenue um, would be reopened, uh, but actually th this connectivity already exists and uh, it, it would not be uh, really uh, an improvement, uh, rather, uh, you know, like the, the, the re re uh, refurbishing of uh, existing connectivity. Uh, next slide. Uh, the uh, the public open space uh, is uh, was something that we discussed uh, quite a bit uh, during the uh, uh, the review of this GPP. Um, to the left, you have the uh, the original uh, proposal, and to the right, you have the uh, proposed alternative. Um, it basically, here uh, what you see is that. Um, Originally, there was some open space that, that was planned. Um, and in the proposed, there is uh, a little more, uh, including um, an additional uh, shared street. 
um, on uh, my glasses. Uh, this on uh, 31st um, uh, would become a pedestrian. Uh, we, I'm sorry, we would become a, a, a shared street. And um, the, uh, the sidewalks would be uh, further uh, enlarged. What is important to note in uh, what public open space means, um, you know, when you say public open space, usually people think parks, right? You know, like Union Square, uh, Madison Park. Uh, in that particular case, and, you know, for, for that particular exercise of the GPP, public open space is basically anything that is public and open. That includes sidewalks, that includes shared streets, that includes subway entrances. So um, what we got, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the increment of open space uh, between the, the proposed GBP and uh, the, the revised version is uh, a little bit of uh, sidewalk enlargement and a couple of shared streets. It's also important to note that shared streets would still be used by uh, vehicular, uh, you know, would be open to vehicular traffic. Um, and some shared streets, even in, including in our district, have been very successful. Uh, in that particular um, instance, it would be a real challenge because um, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, heavy commercial vehicles would have to use these streets, uh, garbage trucks to serve these enormous towers. And secondly, uh, the big uh, semis that um, uh, provide uh, all the uh, equipment to Madison Square Garden. Uh, they would have to use these streets and uh, it, it becomes a real conflict, you know, as much as have, having, you know, a, a very light traffic of automobiles uh, is, is acceptable uh, and, you know, coexist well with, with pedestrians, uh, having uh, garbage trucks and huge uh, uh, semis uh, on, on these blocks uh, would be uh, a big conflict. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so this this is uh, two renderings of what the shared streets uh, would would look like. Um, you know, th there would be uh, quite a bit of uh, of greening. Um, the 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 reality though is that you know the, the, these renderings look very uh, very charming and and sunny. Um, they don't include any vehicles on on the shared streets. Um, gar well, as I said, you know, garbage trucks uh, would uh, would have to drive through. Uh, it's especially true for um, the uh, the 31st Street uh, uh, rendering. Uh, you can see Madison Square Garden uh, with its uh, curved facade. Um, this street uh, would be used by uh, by semis uh, to do the deliveries, um, which would render uh, you know pedestrian uh, safely walking there uh, much more uh, uncomfortable. Um, the other point I would make for this, these renderings is that uh, the, uh, uh, the shadow studies show that these areas would be uh, would not be uh, accessible to uh, to direct daylight. So uh, these nice patches of uh, of sun that you see on on the sidewalks would not exist. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so this is uh, the, uh, the, the the skyline for a little bit of context. Uh, so you can see to the west uh, Hudson Yards, um, the Empire Station Complex, uh, which is actually was renamed, uh, is now known as the uh, the Penn Area uh, Complex, I think. And then uh, to the east, you can see uh, East Midtown. Um, so. Very clearly, um, the uh, uh, the proposed uh, towers would be uh, very tall, uh, exceeding the height of uh, some of the Hudson Yards. Uh, actually, most of the Hudson Yards building, and um, would uh, create uh, also possibly uh, a, a, a competing market for uh, commercial real estate, uh, given that Hudson Yards is uh, struggling. Uh, with uh, excess uh, vacancy and um, East Midtown is in the process of 
uh, having a number of towers being redeveloped and um, all these interests may uh, compete with, uh, with, with each other. Uh, next slide. Okay, on the financing and funding, hopefully I still have your attention because that's a, a complicated one. So the way this uh, process is supposed to work is that um, the, the state would take over this area. Uh, they would enter into a, uh, a, a purchase and lease back with uh, Vornado for the Vornado owned uh, property. So the state would buy the properties from Vornado and would lease back the properties to Vornado for the same amount that, that they purchased, you know, probably $1. What that would create is that it would, because it would be state owned and leased back to a developer, then it would be eligible for uh, what is called pilots and pilots stand for payments in lieu of taxes. So the developer, instead of paying their real estate taxes directly to the city, would now pay their real estate taxes to ESD. And what they, do, what they would do is that instead of paying monthly or annually, they would basically determine uh, how much these taxes are going to be worth for, let's say, you know, 20 years or 30 years, and then they would pay everything up front. Okay, so sounds kind of good. And, you know, it's like, okay, it's, it's, it's a good idea. Let's push the, 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 the situation further. Vornado, and we've been told that much, Vornado would like to get a tax incentive. And they're saying that, you know, short of a lack of, of a tax incentive, uh, this, this project would not be feasible, not, not desirable. Furthermore, the city is saying, well, we don't want to lose tax revenue. We still want to collect some tax revenue out of these buildings. So if you get less tax revenue, you get the city that still wants its share then it begs the question, how much money is left out of this revenue capture uh, scheme? Furthermore, you only start paying taxes once the building is constructed. The problem though, is that we need the money now to fund the MTA reconstruction of Penn and the expansion that is going to be led by Amtrak. And the state of New York needs to pay their share of these two projects. And we're told that, you know, that's why we need this, this GPP. So what is going to happen is that ESD is going to issue bonds against this pilot revenue that theoretically is going to come at, at some point. But because these bonds are going to be based on uncertain revenue, the state is going to have to upgrade the rating of these bonds and up upgrading bonds, bond rating is actually very expensive. So the state is going to have to pay money to actually get money out of these bonds. So that's going to cost tax dollars uh, money. They're going to issue the bonds and then they're going to have to start paying interest on the bonds. And then eventually when the bonds come to maturity, they're going to have to repay the bond holders. All of that is going to happen and revenue will probably still not be coming into the coffers of the state. So we're going to have to borrow money to repay, to pay the interest and to repay the bondholders. And all of that is actually going to cost money instead of generating revenue. And this is exactly what is happening with Hudson Yards. Uh, as one of the, you know, the speakers uh, in the public session mentioned, Hudson Yards has cost the city of New York because the city agreed to guarantee the, uh, the, the scheme. It has cost $2.2 billion. Uh, the uh, IBO has actually uh, issued some reports on, on this issue and is, is gravely concerned. Um, this scheme is very similar. So it is very reasonable to think that uh, rather than being a value capture uh, funding scheme, it is actually going to be a liability. Furthermore, the revenue that even in the best case scenario, the revenue that would be collected through these taxes may actually not be commensurate with 
what the state of New York needs to provide as their share of funding for the pen reconstruction and uh, pen expansion. So in any case, the state is gonna have to find other funding mechanisms. Uh, so for all these reasons, it is very, very dubious that uh, the, the funding scheme, which is really the main goal of, of this project, um, is going to generate the, re the revenue that, uh, that it needs. Um, ESD is also talking about creating a, uh, a general fund as well as a public realm fund that would be um, uh, captured from uh, this alleged revenue uh, to, to do public realm improvements uh, in addition to you know, the, uh, the reconstruction of Penn and, and the extension. Uh, we did have a, a very thorough presentation from uh, Ernst & Young, um, who, as I said, is the consultant for ESD as well as for uh, Vornado. And um, it appears very clearly that um, they, they do recognize that it's going to be a, a challenge um, to actually raise revenue this way and uh, that additional sources of funding are going to be needed. So if, afford, if other sources of funding are going to be needed, uh, we may as well not do this GPP and uh, let the, the city uh, deal with land use uh, issues, which is really the prerogative of the city, um, uh, so that we don't get the, uh, the, the state into a, uh, a deep uh, financial hole. Uh, next slide. All right, so <laughs> uh, hopefully I still have your, your attention. I'm sorry, I know it's, it's long and, and, uh, and very dense. So uh, yesterday, the, uh, the Land Use Housing and Zoning Committee uh, had a, uh, a meeting. We had a presentation from ESD. We're very grateful that they appeared uh, in front of our committee. Um, they told us about uh, the revisions that they've made to the plan. Um, we had a, a robust public session. Uh, members of the public came and testified uh, pretty much to you know, the same tune of what you heard uh, tonight. It was, uh, you know, all the comments were in opposition. There was not uh, one comment in uh, favor. And uh, we, we passed a, uh, a resolution that basically uh, echoes a resolution we passed in March. Uh, we still think that this proposal is uh, ill-guided and we're still opposed to it. And these are the bullet points on the areas that we uh, focus our attention uh, as the grounds for um, our uh, recommendation to deny the proposal. So we still think that the, the density is inappropriate, too much. Uh, it is not desirable and it is uh, overwhelming in scale massing and concentration. Uh, displacement, we heard uh, quite a bit about that tonight. Uh, we believe that uh, displacing uh, residents and businesses is unacceptable. Uh, funding and financing, I went at nauseam on that. So you, I think you understand why it really doesn't work. Uh, through running. Uh, so although the, the, the train uh, transit uh, portion is not part of the GPP, we believe that if through running were to be implemented, the need and the scope for this GPP would be vastly different. We would need much less money and there would be no need to uh, demolish the block to the south. So it would entirely reshape uh, what this GPP and this land use real estate proposal would, uh, would look like. So we are urging to uh, actually give through running a very deep and good uh, consideration uh, because it would be much cheaper, uh, much more efficient at uh, moving people uh, in, the, uh, in the region and uh, it would be a, uh, a much, uh, much less damaging intervention because it would not require uh, the use of eminent domain. Uh, ULERP, uh, so we believe that um, the, uh, the state really has no business in uh, any land use uh, actions in the city of New York, uh, certainly not in our district uh, and certainly not in this area. And uh, therefore, if there has to be a land use action. Um, it has to go through ULERP, which is the city environmental review process. 
uh, it affords uh, the community board uh, much uh, stronger uh, participation. Um, it has checks and balances. It's introduced by the administration and the city council uh, has a say in, in the process. Actually, the city council approves the, uh, the, the, the final proposal. So it is a, uh, a much more transparent and uh, balanced uh, process. Uh, MSG, uh, we did talk about it. Uh, we believe that MSG uh, must be relocated. And unless MSG is relocated, it is not possible to fix Penn Station, uh, especially at the platform and track level. Um, so uh, this proposal is a missed opportunity. Once again, if we're gonna do a land use action in this area, MSG must be part of it and a, uh, a new site must be identified for uh, this, uh, this arena. Uh, we are reiterating that uh, also the tax break that ML MSG uh, benefits from is not justified and must be repealed. Uh, they haven't paid taxes since the 80s. Uh, view corridors, uh, we touched on it very briefly, uh, but basically these buildings would block the views of the Empire State Building. Um, there are some uh, modest uh, modifications that would uh, provide a little more uh, views or a little less obstructions along 33rd Street, but we believe that overall uh, the impact of the proposed development on the numerous new corridors is unacceptable. Uh, shadows, we also touched on that very briefly, uh, but you know these towers would uh, basically create canyons uh, that would be very um, uh, ve very unfriendly to, uh, to users and, and pedestrians. Uh, historic resources, uh, there's a number of uh, historic resources in the uh, proposed area that would be demolished if this proposal were to go uh, through and they include the, uh, the Church of St. John the Baptist on 31st Street, uh, the Gimbel's Bridge, uh, which is this uh, beautiful copper clad uh, suspended bridge that links uh, the, those two buildings uh, between 31st and 32nd. Um, and then finally, the role of New York City in uh, the approval of, uh, of this GPP. So this is a, uh, a recent development that we discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, the proposed GPP um, is actually seeking a letter of support from the New York City Planning Commission. And uh, we believe that um, while this letter does not require a vote from the CPC, uh, the City Planning Commission, uh, we basically think that you know, this current City Planning Commission that has 29 more days to serve should really defer any decision or recommendation until the new administration is sworn in. Uh, and we urge the current administration to also defer any decision on authorizing the pilots, the payment in lieu of taxes. Um, we understand that there are negotiations between the city and uh, ESD, and uh, we believe that uh, they, should, they should defer uh, to the next administration on uh, making any uh, determination or decision on that. Uh, I think that concludes my deck, but maybe there's a next slide. Is there a next slide? No. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, uh, the committee yesterday uh, voted uh, to uh, recommend denial of the GPP for all the reasons. Uh, we put together a resolution. Um, I think, I hope it was shared with... Uh, the, uh, the the full membership of uh, of the board, uh, but you know this slide is basically the the, the summary and the rationale um, for you know the, the more salient points. Uh, but um, the the reso is uh, long and detailed, and um, hopefully at some point you will have a chance to um, read it thoroughly. Uh, but you know this slide summarizes the. Um, the main reasons why we believe this, this project is uh, ill-guided and should be denied. My goodness. <laughs> so I'm assuming you want to have the resolution deemed read. I would like that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, does anyone have any conflicts with the matter that's before us this evening. 
If so, raise your hand. Okay, that takes us to questions to this monumental proposal. Who has questions? Please raise your hand. Uh, David. Where, where to begin? <laughs> the, <laughs> I, I really just had two specific questions. At the time that Moynihan Station was financed, the air rights above that were sold to Fornado and related, I think, for something like $600 million. But I, I thought these were the sites in which those air rights were going to be used, which would make the GPP the tool by which that transaction would kind of be completed. Is that correct? Is that was that part of the rationale for the increase in the floor area ratio from the as of right um, FAR? Was, yes. Is so, there something else um, in the background? Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're correct. So when Moynihan was, uh, was developed, uh, it was basically decided that uh, the, uh, the air rights would be transferred to what is uh, currently known in this GPP as uh, Site 4. So site four currently can be developed as a uh, one million square foot tower um, tomorrow. Like they can pull a permit, you know, the air rights uh, are, you know, certified as, you know, they can go from uh, Moynihan uh, or, you know, Farley, whatever you want to call it, uh, over there. Uh, in the scenario under the, the Moynihan uh, GPP, the, the building has to be hotel and residential which of course is probably the reason why Vornado hasn't acted upon, you know, this uh, very generous excess density. They're not interested in building a hotel and a residential building at that site. What we understand is that they want this GPP that would basically still keep the amount of air rights. So the air rights, you know, the, the way they described it initially because we asked the question and they said, yeah, they are going to evaporate. <laughs> like mm, air rights don't really evaporate so they don't evaporate they basically are just being distilled and you know sent over to uh to site four and uh what uh, what uh the the developer is trying to achieve here is actually uh create a use change so that they can build a, a commercial building that would be part of the you know the Penn campus by Vornado as they they call it but the, the, the math on how they're getting to these higher floor area ratios is not just as of right plus Moynihan transfer equals this new number. There's, yeah. there's other air rights being created as part of this proposal. It is, it is a straightforward upzoning. Okay. And the, the yeah. current, the, the base zoning, so that you know, everybody understands, the base zoning is 10 FAR for residential building and 15 FAR for a commercial building. And more or less, because actually the, the, uh, the, 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 the zoning map sort of like is, is a, a mishmash in, in this area, but you know, roughly if we wanna do a simple calculation, it's you know, 10 base FAR re residential and 15 commercial. And I, I just had a second question. The, um... Was the port of housing discussed as one of the community uses? Because there is a community, a population here that's different than just affordable housing, you know, that congregates around a public facility like a train station. I worked near there. I've worked there for 20 something years. And um, so I, I, I was wondering whether anybody has put that on the table as a possible solution to the homeless population uh, in the area. Yes, there's been intense uh, discussions on that. There is a, a require. They, there could be a requirement for uh, a community facility, but this community it remains to be seen what kind of a community it would serve. I mean, community facility is a very broad term that could include, uh, you know, a school, a preschool. Uh, um, you know, it could, it could be a, a variety of, uh, of different types of, uh, of community services. Um, you know, certainly we've had many discussions uh, about how, how to deal with, uh, with social services, how to deal with the issue of homelessness, uh, mental illness. Um, you know, the, the, there's a population that is in, in dire need of, of services. 
and um, you know the, the response has been uh, demure at best. Did our committee consider adding that to our requirements or? Uh... Yes, it, it is. It is in, in the uh, in, in the resolution. It's actually from, from the, uh, the the original uh, resolution. We are actually on record saying that, you know, this uh, social services and very specifically targeted to, you know, the population that is currently present in, in the area um, need, needs to be addressed. Yeah. OK, thanks. Thank you, David. Good questions. Does anyone have uh, any other questions? And Vicky, if, if I can just uh, add one uh, quick point uh, to, uh, to David's question, uh, the, uh, the community services uh, facility would be actually located in CB4. So it's, a, it's in, on uh, site one, which is, you know, the, the, the site that is uh, to, the, uh, to the west of, uh, of 8th Avenue. Uh, and CB4 has been playing a, uh, you know, a stronger role, you know, simply because geographically it's, it's in their district. Um, and, and the plan currently does not uh, provide any community services of any type uh, in CB5. Which is why we are, you know, on record saying we need something. Thanks, Leila. BJ, have a question? Yes, I think Leila kind of already answered some of it. I was wondering which other communities are affected by this and what their positions have been, if any. So uh, there's one site in CB4, uh, site one that would generate uh, actually two buildings. Um, CB4 is actually opposed to this proposal. Um, they actually voted on a, a letter uh, yesterday at their full board meeting um, for a variety of reasons, uh, but they, that essentially uh, hinges on uh, affordable housing. They're basically satisfied that uh, they're gonna get some affordable housing, uh, but they believe that it's not enough. Um, and uh, overall, they share, uh, you know, most of our concerns, uh, you know, they, they did not opine on anything that is really only affecting CD5, uh, but, you know, certainly uh, shadows are of, con uh, are of concern. Uh, uh, pedestrian congestion is, uh, is of concern to them. And, um, and they are also, uh, you know, in involved in the, the review of uh, Penn Station reconstruction and, uh, and expansion. Uh, they believe that, you know, an alternative that would not necessitate the uh, use of eminent domain is uh, an imperative. Um, so, you know, overall, uh, you know, a lot of uh, shared positions on, the, on this. And then, you know, other communities that are impacted by that, um, you know, one could make the case that, you know, the, the entire city is going to be impacted. Um, and, uh, you know, possibly, uh, I think it's reasonable to make the case that the entire region is going to be impacted. I mean, this is a once in a lifetime, once in a century opportunity to fix Penn Station. We can't get it wrong. We can't. We need to get it right. And I'm not talking about 10 buildings. It's like, in a way, it's like, who cares? What we need to focus on is fixing Penn for today and for the next 100 years. We have many from the federal government to a proportion that we've never seen before. So the money is there. The state of New York is a wealthy state that can find ways through the legislature and through the regular budget process to get the funding. Same thing for New Jersey, who is a, a you know equal partner with New York in uh, the, the, the funding breakdown of, of these proposals. So um, it is really imperative that uh, Penn Station gets fixed and the proper way. So my very long answer to say that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter that, uh, you know, affects really the, the region and in a way the nation. Uh, additionally, CB4, you know, in addition to affordable housing, they are very concerned about historic preservation. They spent a lot of time discussing that and uh, talking about um, going forward, talking to CB5 about that. Um, next question would be Todd. Yes, Layla. 
uh, sad to say I wasn't able to attend many of these public hearings. It seems like the feedback based on what I'm hearing tonight and what I've read in the papers and the news is overwhelmingly negative. During all this time, were there any independent stakeholders or anybody that had anything good to say about this project other than, I guess, Vornado and you know the various people that have a stake in this huge construction project? You know, as we consider this, is there is there anything in favor of this? I, I hear just very small comments about minimal affordable housing. Is there anything good to be said about this project? Uh, I'm going to ask uh, EJ and Clayton and Vicky to uh, try to scratch their heads and see if anyone made a uh, positive comment in the course of all these meetings that we had with all these various uh, stakeholders. I mean, the, you know, the, 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 the city doesn't like it. Uh, most of the civics, they don't like it. Transportation people, they don't like it. Historic preservation people, they don't like it. Uh, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to like honestly think. Uh, EJ, Clayton, Vicky, can, can you think of any groups that... Yeah, Amtrak and MTA. <laughs> but even, you know, even MTA, so, um, you know, Amtrak has been discreet and they're basically saying, you know, we're doing our thing. You know, they, they own the, 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 the train station. They own the below ground uh, space. It's, it's their real estate. So <laughs> they're a, a big stakeholder. But in the end, you know, they're like, they, they, I mean, if the buildings go up, don't go up, they don't care. What they care about is getting the money. That's what they care about. And uh, MTA, I think they're in a slightly different position. What they want, of course, it's the money, but they also want a way for the reconstruction to be done so that it doesn't show on their balance sheet. They are, the debt of the MTA is of such magnitude that they are trying as hard as they can to find a way to fund projects that don't appear on their balance sheet. And in this particular case, because it's ESD that is issuing the bonds, it will not appear on, as debt on MTA's balance sheet. And this is, this is the appeal. But if they could get the money somehow differently and in a way that would not affect their balance sheet and that would not increase their debt service, I think they would be satisfied. Okay, next question from Samir. Hi, sorry, this might be like a ordering thing, but if I have a question about the specific language in the resolution and perhaps want to propose an amendment, would now be the right time to do it or in a follow-up section of the discussion? No. Okay, um, so I read through it um, and in the conclusion, it talks about how the majority of Penn Station users are New Jersey commuters. I was unable to find data to support that. And most of the data I saw said that the majority of users by a significant magnitude are Long Island Railroad users. And even after, you know, East Side Access is done and 40% of the people move over, it will still be majority Long Island Railroad. In addition, like New Jersey has built a significant amount of new housing, especially compared to Long Island, which has built almost none, uh, like almost like 15 times more uh, housing units permitted, uh, at least in 2020. So I'd propose that we change the language instead of calling out New Jersey to talk about Long Island. Um, so I guess it would be on lines 579, 580, and 582 to change New Jersey to Long Island. Uh, so actually, um, the I, I can I can get you the the other source. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, my computer is dying. Hold on, I need I need to give it some juice. I believe that's information that. So, is so, sorry, sorry about that. I'm I'm having uh, difficulties. Can, can you still hear me? Yep. 
Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, great, great. So, sorry about that. Um, so I, ca I can get you the source of this information, but 60% of uh, the users of Penn Station are uh, New Jersey, use New Jersey Transit. And okay, we're, we're talking to, about the, the train station itself. We're not talking about the, the subway um, uh, station, but the train station itself is 60% uh, uh, of the users are uh, New Jersey Transit. So I and I, I can I can get you the, uh, the the data for that. Yeah, I definitely love to see that. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Uh, John. Uh, yes, I have. Um, uh, uh, I would like to. If, if someone can. I'm elaborate. sorry. I cannot. I cannot hear you. I don't know what's happening with my. Okay. Can everybody else hear me? Yes, John, go ahead. Okay. You, you went out in the beginning, start again. Okay, I, I would like for someone to elaborate a little bit. I think on, you can I'll... hear me, but I cannot hear you guys. I can see that I'm not, let me, let me actually get these back. Hold on, John, sorry about that. No problem. Layla, are you there? I don't think I can hear you. You want to try using your phone? Oh, okay. Now, now it's working again. Okay. okay. I'm so sorry. So sorry about that. Okay, John, go ahead. Okay. Uh, first, um, um, I'll, I'll ask all three and then you can respond. First, uh, I'd like to uh, get a little clarification on opposition regarding uh, eminent domain. Uh, do we have a blanket opposition? to the use of, dom uh, of eminent domain in this, in this um, project, uh, or would we be open to some targeted uh, eminent dom domain? I just wanted to seek a clarification from that based on my reading of, uh, of the resolution. Uh, second, um, have we uh, talked to uh, the mayor elect or his representatives about this project? And if so, what sort of feedback have we received? And third, um, have, did you all discuss any parallel actions we can take regarding uh, Hotel Pennsylvania in the meantime um, uh, to, to uh, prevent its, uh, its uh, untimely uh, uh, demolition of that uh, property? Uh, so yes, we are opposed to eminent domain. We think that you know displacement is just not acceptable, and I mean, domain is a tool of the 19th century that should not be used. Um, there, there are other ways um, to address uh, the issues that are uh, raised uh, that would that allegedly would necessitate uh, eminent domain. Um, the reason why uh, eminent domain is needed, we're told, is that in order to create this uh, expansion to, uh, to the south, um, you need to put the, uh, the tracks and then you need to have trains coming on these tracks. The tracks actually are proposed to be pretty shallow and therefore the trains would get in, uh, in the way of the, the, the existing structure of the existing buildings. So you can't have you know, the, 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 the columns that support these buildings basically conflict with the area where uh, the, the trains would, uh, would need um, uh, to, uh, to go through. So that's why we're told uh, these, uh, these buildings need to, to be demolished and eminent domain and condemnation needs to be used. Um, we also know that Eastside Access um, was uh, able to successfully bore underneath uh, Grand Central Terminal to actually create a, uh, a level, a subterranean level and you know the same thing can can be used uh, as a uh, as a way of expanding. Uh, but we've also been given presentations on uh, through running that would basically provide the uh, increased capacity at Penn Station um, and would not require uh, to put new tracks. 
um, on your question regarding uh, engaging with the uh, the mayor elect, we have not uh, communicated with the mayor elect, and we don't do not know uh, where he stands on on this proposal. And uh, on uh, Hotel Pennsylvania, Community Board Five is on record, as I said, ten or twelve years ago, uh, when uh, Vornado actually seeked a uh, a special permit through a uh, ULERP city-run uh, environmental review process to uh, actually upgrade the uh, the site. Uh, special permit that was granted and that uh, subsequently uh, lapsed. Um, so, uh, you know, from, from this original uh, review process, uh, we are on record uh, recommending uh, historic designation of the property. And uh, it is our understanding that uh, the uh, historic preservation civic groups of uh, New York are actually uh, making a very strong push for historic designation to happen. Okay, so, uh, so that means since it's on the radar, is it sitting sort of on that so-called list at LPC, therefore it can't be touched currently, or no, can you it has that? absolutely no, no, it has no. no that's what I whatsoever. thought. So it could it could be done away with tomorrow currently. Correct. correct? Yes. Okay. yes. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Let's see. I did see Mary. Um, did you want to ask a question, Mary? Yeah, I, I don't want to keep us too late, but um, I was just wondering if. if it, if you feel comfortable, who in the city is saying that they're against it? I, I just worry because the developers of Moynihan are represented by Kramer Levin, the same law firm that represented the Blood Center, the same law firm that the current mayor owes nearly a half a million dollars to. So I not only worry about the next 28 days, but I, I agree with John that we should figure out or try to get an audience with Eric Adams uh, for the following four years. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, anyone else regarding any questions? If not, we will move to comments. Any comments? Buzz? No? Okay. Todd? Based on all I've heard, this is, it's amazing to me how many of the issues that we've spent so much time talking about, open space, Madison Square Garden, open streets, shadows, uh, uh, affordable housing, how many of those things are bound up in what happens to Penn Station? I just wanna say, I agree 100% with what Layla said. You know, what happens to Penn Station is going to impact all of those things to such an unbelievable degree that we have to use every ounce of our influence and determination to make sure that this issue is before the public and that the interests that are promoting this are challenged and held to account to the utmost degree of our ability. And I just wanna thank all of the people on our community board that have worked on this uh, and have put together this resolution for their efforts. Now I wholeheartedly support it and I think we should all support it. Thank you, Todd. Okay, uh, EJ. Uh, I'll, I'll just... As Layla said, um, I, I sat on the CAC working group for the last six or so months as well. I'll just really quickly reiterate some of the stuff I said at committee last night. Um, first of all, Layla, thank you for the phenomenal <laughs> presentation to the full board unpacking all of that. That was, that was, that was months and months of uh, research packed into um, uh, a few minutes very succinctly. Um, I, Nobody, nobody that I have ever heard speak on the topic anywhere in the city disputes the fact that we need to rebuild Penn Station, that we need to expand the capacity of Penn Station, and that we need to connect to the gateway tunnels. No one seems to dispute that. Um, what we're faced with here is this land use action and whether or not it's the right or only way to pay for these things. Um, 
We've seen several revisions of this plan at this point, and the most fundamental things in the plan have not changed. Um, we don't really know yet what this kind of massive land use in these 10 skyscrapers are meant to pay for. If it is a Southern expansion, we don't know what it looks like or how much it costs yet. If it's not a Southern expansion, as some other speak, as some speakers talked about today, um, you know, there are other options. There's drilling down under the current station. There's uh, a Northern expansion. There's things like through running. Um, we, uh, uh, there, <laughs> a formal EIS has not even assessed whether or not that's the right thing to pay for, but we're talking about how to pay for it. Um, so, so we don't even know what this land use action is meant to pay for yet. The process of course is backwards. If this is about a train station, we should probably figure out what the right train station is to build first find out how much it costs and, and, and effectuate a, a, an appropriate land use action uh, uh, for that. It should go through the city's review process so that we're not just dropping another Hudson Yards in the middle of the city. And finally, um, you know, the, the, the original sin of the district was putting a commercial building on top of our train station back in 1963. And this GPP proposes doing it again for the expansion that it talks about paying for, which just seems insane to me. So, you know, for all the reasons that Layla so eloquently articulated, um, uh, this, this seems like the wrong way to pay for infrastructure improvement for many, many different reasons. Thanks, EJ. Clayton, <clears throat> I know you're on by phone, right? Yeah, I'm using my phone as a hotspot right now, so I can't turn my camera on. Um, I do, I mean, my God, Layla has done such a comprehensive job representing all this to us. I'm not going to be redundant, but just as chair of Parks and Public Spaces and all the issues that we have weighed in on over the years from our committee, I just wanted to quickly chime in that I am in complete agreement with everything that Layla has set forward and one interesting thing is that ESD repeatedly cites East Midtown as a model for what is going on with this GPP. And so if they are trying to cite the East Midtown rezoning and the process we went through with that adding model, I'd like to point out for members of the public and the board that Oops, I think we lost Clayton. Let's see if he gets back on. Clayton? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, you went out for about seven or eight seconds. East Midtown, this is not. And number two, East Midtown and the public realm improvements were tied to a funding mechanism that was a known entity. And this is not. And the other point I want to make is that the percentage of new open space that ESD is representing will be part of this proposal includes the sidewalks. I find this to be absurd. Additional open space should not include sidewalks, which are literally already there. Um, I mean, there's so much more I can say, but just as chair of this committee, I, I felt that I should just chime in on those points. Wonderful, thank you, Clayton. Do we have any other comments from any other? Uh, good, David. Very briefly, I just wanna thank Layla, uh, EJ, Clayton and Vicky for the amazing amount. The resolution is astounding that a volunteer group could come up with a proposal this intelligent, this well-written and thought out, this thoughtful, it, it's astounding. I've never been prouder to be a member of community before, uh, community board five, than this particular proposal. You've done such an amazing job. And perhaps this might be a good moment to make a motion to deny. Okay, Is there a second. So j just for the record, we're denying the GPP, but approving the reso. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely, yes. Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we take this to a vote, talk about being proud, I really have to say 
uh, from the bottom of my heart, I can't tell you how much I appreciate my colleagues, Layla, EJ, and Clayton, and the work that's been done on this, honestly. Uh, they are just, I, I, I'm almost at a loss, I am at a loss for words. And I've run out of adjectives. I keep saying this, I've really run out of adjectives. So let me just say again, thank you, thank you, thank you from my heart and for CB5, really. Um, and without further ado, let's take this to a vote. Okay. Michaelis. Yes. Athenale. Yes. Behar. Yes. Eichmann. Yes. Rosnahan. Yes. Castro. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Ford. Yes. Frewer. Yes. Haas. Is Haas still on? Hot Tristan. I see he's still on. He's not a yes. Okay. So Haas is a yes. Harris. Yes. Hirschberg. Yes. Hire. Yes. Isaacs. Yes. Uh, Quebec. Yes. Hung. Kathy? Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Kalaparski? Yes. Kinsella? Yes. Lavingia? Yes. Lagasico? Yes. Leone? Yes. Libise? Yes. Lusick? Yes. McCall? Yes. Miller? Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Sigmund. Yes. Slutskin is a yes. Smith. Yes. Uh, Spence. Yes. Stern. Yes. Sung. Yes. Whalen. I thought I saw him before. He got on anymore. Uh, Yang. Yes. The motion passes. Uh, Craig. Um, Do, you vote? Do you wish to vote? I really want to vote on this. Um, okay. I've only so, done this, I think, two times in my tenure, my 12 years as chair. And this is one of those times when I want to vote and not abstain, even though that's been the, the uh, past precedent for all chairs of Board 5. In yep. this case, I'd like to vote yes. So noted. Okay. And it passes. All right. Thank you, Kayla and team. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone for this extra time you've put in this evening. We finished up eight o'clock on the dot. I appreciate all of you and of course my special colleagues and have a lovely rest of your evening and we'll see you next week at full board. Thank you again. Good night, everyone. Thank you all. Guys, thanks Layla.